So my name is Alexander Lukin. I'm the head of Department of International Relations and International Laboratory on World Order Studies and the New Regionalism of uh, High School of Economics, which is a national research university here in Russia. And we're beginning our 16th session of Eurasian Online Seminar. Our guest today, we are delighted to have uh, Ambassador Sujan Chinoy, who is a very important Indian diplomat and a foreign policy and security analyst. The topic of his talk uh, is going to be the changing dynamics of the Indo Pacific. Ambassador Chinoy is currently the, the Director General of the Manohar Parikar. Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi, which is uh, an important partner of our university. We uh, made, uh, organized several events there and did two special issues of the journal, uh, Strategic Analysis, which is published by the, uh, by the Institute. And we hope to continue our cooperation. Ambassador Chino is a career diplomat of the Indian Foreign Service uh, and uh, he served in the Foreign Service from 1981 to 2018. He was India's ambassador to Japan from 2015 to 2018 and earlier um, the ambassador to Mexico and also High Commissioner to Belize. Ambassador Chinoy uh, has 25 years experience on China, East Asia, and the Asia Pacific. He, he served in Indian missions in Hong Kong and Beijing and as Council General in Shanghai and Sydney. He also served as India's representative to the first committee at the United Nations in New York, which, uh, which is dealing with disarmament international security and international security affairs and then the Indian mission uh, in Riyadh. At headquarters in the Ministry of External Affairs he served as director for China as well as head of the expert group of diplomatic and military officials tasked with uh, uh, boundary related issues with China uh, and which is, of course, is a very important in, a very important issue in uh, China China-Indian relations. He also served on the America's um, America's desk uh, dealing with the United States and Canada, and as officer on special duty in charge of press relations in the External Publicity Division. Uh, on deputation for four years with the uh, National Security Council Secretariat under the Prime Minister's office, he worked on the internal and external national security policy and anchored strategic dialogues with key interlocutors around the world. What is even important for us as a university where we teach foreign languages, Ambassador Chinoy is fluent in English, Chinese, Conver and conversant in French, Spanish, German, Japanese, Arabic, Urdu, and even French Creole. I wonder who else can speak French Creole in the diplomatic community. He also speaks uh, Hindi and Gujarati. So we envy your language skills as well as your career very much. Ambassador Chinoy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander Lukin. Uh, head of the department uh, at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you as part of the Eurasian online seminar series. And it's a great privilege for me to be with you uh, this afternoon. Um, I uh, would like to begin with a few general remarks and then show you uh, a fair number of slides, which I will explain as I go along. Uh, the topic, of course, uh, is changing dynamics of the Indo-Pacific. Let me begin by the, making the proposition that we live in an age of great uncertainty. And the only thing constant that we have today is uncertainty and change. Uh, the global situation is characterized by a riding rising tide of nationalism, 
trade protectionism and a battle for technological superiority. In other words, both trade and technology have been weaponized to a very great extent. Uh, multilateralism is at its weakest today, though there is a greater desire for multipolarity. And so there is uh, a dichotomous situation prevailing today when the United States of America, the reigning hegemon, uh, wishes to remain at the top and yet is weakening the very structures that have permitted, to, permitted it to become the number one in the aftermath of the Second World War. On the other hand, you have China, which is a rising power, which is uh, challenging the existing order in a selective manner. It attempts to use the existing order in order to project itself as the great new protector of the liberal trading order. It also ironically uh, projects itself as a multilateralist nation as against the United States of America, which is looking inwards and uh, not engaging as much as it did before. And uh, the Chinese are also creating new structures uh, which can help China to prove the superiority of its uh, developmental and governance models. So we have a situation in which uh, there is a fragile international order. And this uh, international compact that existed until a few months ago has in fact been rendered a huge blow by the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic is going to have broader implications, not just for economies around the world, but also uh, in terms of developmental priorities. The guns versus butter debate uh, will be uh, accentuated in years to come simply because the world will have less to go by, less money for any kind of armaments, so to speak. So the pandemic is bound to have a broader implication for military postures uh, and uh, issues of sovereignty and territorial integrity as well, including in the broad maritime space of the Indo-Pacific. Today, the Indo-Pacific is a buzzword that has been interpreted differently by various countries in their outlook or vision documents. And yet we have seen that in recent months, there has been a greater convergence between the countries that speak of an outlook or vision for the Indo-Pacific region. Notably, there is growing convergence between the United States, Japan, Australia, and India in terms of certain definitional aspects, though their view of the Indo-Pacific cannot be said to be identical. Now, the Indo-Pacific is a recognition, essentially, of the fact that the two vast ocean, oceanic spaces of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean and the intervening space of the South China Sea are interconnected and interdependent. However, economic success in the Indo-Pacific region has not been matched by a corresponding strategic consensus on the creation of a stable security architecture. So we have seen in various parts that the Asia Pacific region, the Far East has done well for itself over the years in economic terms. The Southeast Asian landmass has also done well. And now growth is spreading towards South Asia and Africa. And there is a wider community that potentially can prosper from globalization. But a stable security architecture remains the holy grail. It is still very evasive. There are contradictions existing and new ones of trade, territorial disputes, and geostrategic contestations. And these are being played out frequently in the region. Now, India's geographic location, per se, makes it a very key stakeholder in the maritime commons, primarily in the Indian Ocean, but also in the broader space of the South China Sea and beyond in the Pacific Ocean. India has, uh, as you all know, been first responder on a number of occasions during several of the region's natural disasters, not limited to the Indian Ocean. We have seen that during the 2004 tsunami, when India and Indian naval ships were among the first to respond to search and rescue operations and other requirements uh, as far away as in Indonesia. India has used its considerable naval and 
airlift capabilities newly acquired ones also to conduct humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations particularly to help uh, island nations such as maldives sri lanka uh, fiji uh, and other countries like uh, mozambique and the philippines as well so let me just uh, uh, conclude my opening remarks here before i show you the slides by saying that the indo pacific region is destined for further change um, there will be greater uh, dialogue in years to come uh, and there will be viewpoints expressed by china by the russian federation and others as well uh, but given the indivisibility of security and threats what is needed is an indivisibility of efforts to resolve issues with those opening remarks let me show you the slides um i'm on screen sharing now and i would like to move to the next slide just one sec please can you see the first slide please so i want to begin with the proposition that the seas have always been historically important no matter what part of the world here is a collection of a select few gentlemen who made a name for themselves through their seafaring adventures and conquests and search for new space and new vistas in ages past you had for instance in our part of the world bartholomew dias uh, bartholomew dias who in the middle ages went towards india could not uh, make it and eventually it was uh, vasco da gama who came to india in 1498 you had uh, columbus who went uh, to the americas and thinking he had discovered india in fact and founded the new world there you had uh, magellan who went all the way to the philippines and was killed there so that was the age of discovery the age of exploration the 15th and 16th centuries stand out particularly in that regard the oceans and seas have always facilitated trade and colonization in the past as well in our part of the world the 15th and 16th centuries were landmarks in this regard the portuguese the french the dutch and the british were all part of this great process of looking for new trade routes looking for new markets looking for new sources for spices and other products silk spices uh, jewels gems all sorts of things uh, cotton in the case of india as well Uh, and they mapped distant continents for the first time they sought access to and control of resources they secured trading rights and this led gradually since the flag followed trade it led to colonization in asia africa and even in latin america where people like hernan cortes went and colonized nueva españa which is today mexico so this in my view facilitated the shift from medieval times to the more modern times the more contemporary globalized trading systems that still in fact use the seas predominantly for their uh, efficient uh, circulation around the world india has a rich maritime history our maritime history goes back 4500 years to the time of the indus valley civilization even then india the indian subcontinent had ties with places far away as greece uh, mesopotamia and rome there is evidence of tidal docks in uh, excavated sites archaeologically excavated in important sites like lothal in gujarat which uh, talks of uh, seafaring links uh, 2500 years ago and the impetus then as in later medieval times was the trade the attraction of trade in spices and precious stones but of course fundamentally the idea was that people wanted to avoid the perilous land routes in order to get to distant markets and supply chains for resources the word navigation in the english language comes from etymologically comes from the sanskrit word navgat and the importance of navigation and sailing is mentioned even in the ancient texts in india such as arthashastra which date back to the 4th century bc the spread of buddhism from india to southeast asia to east asia was also instrumental in bringing about closer sea links maritime links between 
India and those parts of the Asia Pacific. Hinduism spread later to Southeast Asia all the way to the Cham empires in Vietnam and to Indonesia where you still have Bali as uh, one of those uh, uh, sort of remaining islands where ancient Hinduist, uh, Hindu, Hindu communities still live. Uh, so Hinduism spread later at the time of the Chola and the Vijayanagar empires uh, about a thousand years after uh, Buddhism had spread in the first and second centuries AD. And then of course you also had Islam spreading from the Arab world to India. And by the sea route, the Arabs came to India, to the Malabar coast, to the west coast for trading. And then Islam went along with trade and the maritime trade routes all the way to Southeast Asia in around the 10th century onwards. Trade with Africa was also phenomenal at that time. And India used to uh, have a, a great deal of contact, cultural, civilizational with the African landmass uh, and such uh, seafaring links were facilitated by the strong uh, currents and the monsoon winds. This uh, slide gives you some idea of the trade routes in the Indian Ocean in ancient times. It looks like a modern map because we are still following the same trade routes by and large. The same uh, channels, uh, sea lanes of communication and the trade routes are what will determine the future of the Indo-Pacific. Now, many people today talk of uh, what is happening in the Indian Ocean. And I'm going to make a proposition here that as uh, a student of, of China and of strategic affairs, I believe that the Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean is very new. It is very recent. It is... Uh, a comeback into the Indian Ocean after a gap of about 600 years. And therefore, in many ways, it is a disruptive presence. Now, it is not disruptive per se, because the seas are supposed to be what you call global commons, and everybody has a right to trade and travel through it. But when presence is new and is accompanied without adequate clarity, without any kind of explanation of not just capacities, but intentions also, it gives rise to misgivings and can create a fair bit of disruption. In the case of China, for instance, uh, 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 let, let's face it. I mean, it was in the 15th century AD that uh, some Chinese expeditions had come to this part of Asia. They went on to other parts of uh, the Indian Ocean, such as Africa as well. Uh, and that was... Uh, explorations conducted by Cheng He, the eunuch uh, admiral out of uh, Nanjing uh, in today's uh, Jiangsu province. And those seven voyages of exploration, uh, you know, provided some kind of a historical context. Uh, there is, of course, uh, in Hamban Tota in Sri Lanka, um, a stone uh, tablet, a totem uh, with inscriptions uh, in Chinese uh, to commemorate the landing of Cheng He around 1405. Uh, it was a pit stop in those uh, journeys conducted by the Chinese armadas then. Um, but the key point here is that uh, uh, I'm not a subscriber to what uh, a, a Chinese apologist like Gavin Menzies says in his book, 1421, the year China discovered the world, because he, this British submariner, uh, who I think is a fantastic submariner with uh, a lot of familiarity with naval terminology, but with very little knowledge of history and facts, claims that the Chinese had circumnavigated the globe before Magellan, they had discovered everything that was to be discovered before anybody else mattered or came onto the sea. Uh, well, his contention was that the Chinese had also discovered Australia before, uh, you know, uh, Cook went there in the uh, later centuries. So uh, today, the, the, the fact that the Chinese had come in 600 years ago into the Indian Ocean is often cited by scholars to demonstrate that China has abiding interests in the Indian Ocean. But the fact of the matter is that it is a new presence. For that matter, I can say that, uh, uh, you know, the Russians have also, as you know, made a small comeback into the Indian Ocean. Russia, as part of the Soviet Union, as legacy state, you know, in the past, the Soviet Union had global interests and the Soviet Union and the Americans uh, 
were also part of the Indian Ocean in those days. Uh, Russia was there in Vietnam, in Kamran Bay. Recently, Russia has come back with joint exercises with China and Iran in the Strait of Hormuz. Russia has come back, as you know, with a joint exercise with China and South Africa in the Western Indian Ocean. So, as I said, it's a global space. All are welcome. But uh, capacities, intentions are very important for others to understand. Now, again, speaking of the importance of the seas, uh, the opening up of Japan uh, with the Treaty of Kanagawa was also a very important historical development in the indo pacific It opened up Japan for the first time to global trade when the Americans, when Admiral uh, Perry, uh, uh, Commodore Perry went in and uh, got the Japanese to agree to certain new trade terms. Uh, and the, the seas have always been important for uh, what you call, uh, you know, sea lanes of communication and trading because one of the reasons why Japan entered the Second World War and bombed Pearl Harbor in 1949 was in response to the U.S. having blocked Japan's sea lanes of communication by imposing a certain amount of oil embargo in the Pacific Ocean. At that time, Japan has now imported almost 90% of its oil. And uh, this is to highlight why seas are so important as lifelines. Island development strategy has been followed by all colonial powers. Development of islands gave colonial powers greater reach for trade. They allowed them to use uh, islands and their natural harbors uh, to their advantage. It was a good uh, vantage point for connecting to the hinterland, for getting uh, you know, uh, populations uh, on the mainland to work for them. Uh, and uh, colonization of Madagascar, Seychelles, Mauritius, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, Macau. These are all examples of island development strategy followed by the colonial powers in the past. And today there are some who allege that China is also following the same neo-colonial approach to territory and natural resources all along the Indo-Pacific. Of course, this is for scholars to research. I'm only pointing at the similarities. Mare Librum, Mare Clausum. These are important concepts because without this, you won't understand the Indo-Pacific of the future. Uh, there was in the Middle Ages strategic uh, competition between Spain and Portugal, between Portugal uh, and uh, uh, the Dutch. And uh, as you know, uh, the, uh, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese had established themselves as great powers. Uh, in parts of Asia, the Dutch were also coming up as a great power. And... Uh, uh, there was uh, a Portuguese vessel uh, that uh, had actually been impounded by the Dutch because uh, the Portuguese were preventing the Dutch from what you call access to the seas. Uh, and the whole concept of uh, the open global commons of the seas was developed by a lawyer uh, called Hugo Grotius, who was commissioned in uh, those days by the Dutch East India Company to write a paper defending that action. And Grotius' argument uh, was much the argument that people would make, nation states would make today, which is that the sea, like the air, cannot be appropriated by a single nation. The sea is international and available to all nations uh, who should be free to use it for seafaring purposes. Of course, that leads to the next question, that when you have unilateral action uh, by certain states, as in the South China Sea uh, or the East China Sea, unilateral declarations of, uh, you know, uh, air identification defense zones. Um, then the question is, is that legal? Is that in accordance with uh, the basic concept of Mare Librum, which is that the open seas should be available to all. Freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight are integral, therefore, to the evolving concept of the Indo-Pacific. The sea is also an anchor of global trade. 90% uh, of the world's uh, trade still is carried by the sea. It's the most cost effective. And slocks, therefore, sea lanes of communication have always got to be free and open. Uh, shipping is itself a huge industry. Uh, by the way, piracy is also a huge industry. You are aware of it. Uh, and it's a lifeline. The seas are a lifeline for most nations. Now, in the pre-COVID world, uh, you know, there were certain trends that were already there. These have only been accelerated by the uh, pandemic and the new pressures that it has created. Uh, I spoke in my initial remarks about the US and China. 
about both being anti status quoist in certain uh, ways um, the chinese of course selectively being anti status quoist um, the us being anti status quoist in general uh, and yet of course us desires a status quo in terms of remaining the preeminent power so there's a bit of a contradiction there trade developmental finance flow of human resources technology all these vectors of globalization have run into headwinds they ran into headwinds well before the pandemic if anything the pressures are only going to increase on all these and create more contradictions for countries you also have an increase in traditional and non traditional security threats sorry uh, advent of automation and ai disruption in conventional global supply chains all this is now manifest in the broad space of the indo pacific power globally is fractured and many countries are overcoming asymmetry through asymmetrical means almost every country is hedging and multi aligning depending on its national interests covid 19 has induced disruption like never before it has exposed exposed flaws in multilateral structures and highlighted the lack of national capacities as i said before multilateralism has suffered retrenchment and uh, global opinion seems weighted against china today china is being called out for not reporting the facts in time for uh, uh, hiding facts uh, but then that probably part of the terrain it goes with the kind of system that is there it's a, it's, it's a unilateral monolithic single party authoritarian state uh, democracies don't work that way because uh, you know sooner or later people get the information and put it out uh, and, and uh, there are legal procedures to follow and there's protection of the law as well um, so what is going to happen in terms of the current standoff with regard to the origin of the virus is anybody's guess uh, whether the who will actually investigate and come up with some uh, details but all this calls for cooperation and what we don't see today is cooperation even the security council is virtually non functional in fact it didn't do any work at the start of the pandemic you are aware of that uh, so what will happen in the post covid era is far from clear uh, uh, i cannot uh, look at a crystal ball and and uh, confirm that it will be uh, the uh, united states that will decline and china that will rise no nothing is certain at all uh, the united states uh, even in the first quarter of this uh, up to the first quarter of this year still contributes to 25% of global trade and it remains uh, uh, you know a, a very very big economy much bigger than the chinese economy with tremendous capacity for innovation uh, and uh, never under uh, underestimate the united states of america they are entirely capable of staging a remarkable comeback uh, uh, without uh, much uh, many of us anticipating that um, now what i would like to say is that uh, ultimately it will require a global dialogue to sort out some of these issues and china's cooperation will also be vital because if you wish to reform global institutions uh, and create a proper dialogue including over the indo pacific you will have to talk to the chinese uh, because they are very much part of most of the institutions uh, including the wto uh, the un security council now minus the united states china is still there as you know in unesco it is there in uh, uh, who uh, and all the other organizations that the chinese have abandoned uh, the americans have abandoned the chinese are still there um the world is in a flux and is likely to remain so asia the indo pacific space included has a number of fault lines and these fault lines are numerous there are territorial disputes between you know india pakistan india china china japan japan korea japan north korea china us china asean there's so many issues there all over the asian century is inevitable but it is not necessarily going to be one that is very uh, peaceful uh, with assured security guarantees the sheer pace at which china is changing has added to the complexity because in my view china itself has not been able to understand uh, the concept of power because this new power has come only in one generation it has never really exercised it or tested the limits of that power as have european countries through several several decades and if not centuries of war and contestation and peace so 
i think that adds to the complexity china's inability to understand the true meaning of power and the extent and limits of the exercise of power so that makes china today more like a unilateralist uh, what what the others used to accuse the americans of in the past that the americans generally have a kick the door down in your face kind of you know diplomacy it's today the chinese that do that and if the americans made a mistake then they are making the same mistakes but of course many scholars say that the chinese are trying to follow <coughs> excuse me what the americans did beginning with the neighborhood in the americas uh, in the uh, you know last century and before in the 19th and 20th centuries the the growth of american power is a model that the chinese are silently following beginning with the own immediate periphery but if there are mistakes then they are bound to make the same mistakes um china's definition of asia for asians or what they call this uh, community for uh, of a shared future for mankind uh, it means nothing there is absolutely no clarity on what they mean by that and if by that they mean that uh, china asia should be unipolar and that pole is china then by the way the rest of asia doesn't agree with that because if the world requires multipolarity at the global level then equally asia requires multipolarity too what's good for the goose is equally good for the ganda as they say in english and secondly uh, china's definition is restrictive because uh, when you say asia for asians you are implying that there are a very large number of extra regional powers who have no right to be in the region but frankly a very large number of those powers actually have a long standing presence in the indian ocean and the pacific ocean and the south china sea Uh, the french the british the americans they have for long been in this region for 70 years if not more with uh, large scale uh, trade economic uh, uh, interests and populations territories uh, the french as you all know have uh, new caledonia uh, mayotte uh, in the pacific ocean uh, the um, uh, wallace islands uh, out there in the indian ocean they have uh, um, you know uh, places uh, uh, and islands of their own uh, so uh, they, they are resident powers as much as uh, uh, i would say the chinese are or india is you now frankly and now there are disruptions in this broad space in the indian and pacific oceans i just tried to break it up into three uh, areas sub zones the western indian ocean um has a new kind of uh, uh, configuration the disruption there is the diminishing value of the gulf as a provider of energy with the rise of the united states as the world's largest oil producer secondly this is the area where uh, you have the fountain head of terrorism in pakistan you have uh, tensions between united states and iran uh, tensions between iran and saudi arabia you have piracy you have all kinds of issues in the western indian ocean uh, then you have the south china sea where the fulcrum and the key point of tension really is the creation of artificial islands by the chinese their exaggerated and preposterous claims uh, of uh, you know uh, owning the whole maritime space in the south china sea uh, through some ridiculous uh, uh, you know nine dash line and cow's tongue and all that uh, which has brought them at the center stage of of uh, disputes uh, in that part of the world so that incremental nibbling unilateralism that the chinese have carried out in the south china sea Uh, the complete indifference to international law and unclos uh, is the great disruptor in the south china sea then you have the pacific where china's growing presence and influence beyond the first island chain um, uh, is also creating a new kind of tension it's causing tensions with australia and new zealand also because in the south pacific the chinese activity of bribing political leaders of acquiring you know uh, port facilities and berthing facilities and all that has created a fair bit of uh, suspicion in the minds of australia and new zealand and australia in particular has <clears throat> has now tried to push back with regard to that kind of influence mongering in its part of the world by the chinese there is um, a, some similarity between the belt and road initiative and the uh, you know sort of uh, actions of the colonial era as well uh in terms of creating dependencies financial dependencies uh, uh natural resources dependencies out of 
countries that require Chinese uh, easy Chinese financing and developmental funds. Um, uh, and I've already mentioned to you the unilateral uh, edis zones that have been created. Uh, uh, yes, there was a Russia-China joint patrol that the, the Republic of Korea said was uh, violating its territorial uh, space, you know, uh, or its, uh, uh, you know, uh, EEZ. And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, ferment there. Um, the Indian Ocean is important uh, for a number of reasons. It is uh, one of the world's uh, uh, most important uh, uh, areas of uh, sea lanes of communication. And as you can see from this slide, a uh, large part of global energy shipments, container uh, shipments, um, bulk cargo passes through the Indian Ocean. Uh, this gives you an idea of the choke points. And the choke points, uh, excuse me, I'm just going to turn on my air conditioning a bit. Choke points are numerous, as you can see, Lombok, uh, Sunda Strait, uh, out there in, in, in uh, Southeast Asia. You have uh, uh, the Strait of Hormuz, uh, Bab al Mandeb on this side in the Red Sea. Uh, so, uh, choke points are extremely important to the entire space, particularly in the Indian Ocean. Um, India and Indian Ocean, I have uh, given you some information, so I will just breeze through this uh, slide. Indian initiatives in the Indian Ocean region are numerous. We have an initiative for development of the blue economy, uh, Sagar. Sagar is security and growth for all in the region. Uh, and it also means in the Indian language, ocean or sea. Sagar Mala means uh, uh, building infrastructure, uh, which connects our ports and other facilities to inland waterways. And then um, Project uh, Mossam, which uh, uh, looks to utilizing are traditional and historical linkages of the past, especially with uh, the African uh, East, East Africa. The, the proposition here is that Asia Pacific is an outdated concept. There are a lot of people who say, why do we need the Indo-Pacific? Why can't we just continue to talk about the Asia Pacific? I think there are some Russian scholars also who would prefer to use the term Asia Pacific, who may not want to or uh, like uh, the term Indo-Pacific. Um, now I'll explain what the reason is here. You see, Asia itself is a colonial concept and the Asia Pacific as a concept gained coinage and currency after the Second World War because it defined the links that were being created between Japan and the big market in the United States across the Pacific. And thereafter, it was defined by the Asian tigers like uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, South Korea, uh, Singapore, uh, these were the countries that actually had growing trade links with, uh, again, the largest market in the world, the United States of America across the Pacific. So in the aftermath of the Second World War, you had this term Asia Pacific that came up and became accepted in usage. Now, Asia Pacific is a limited term because it does not give full expression to Asia's true continental significance and potential because it does not include a large part of what we call Asia. It does not include South Asia. It certainly does not include the dynamic part of East Africa that is growing. Uh, and so as growth has spread after the 1980s and 90s, uh, you have first China coming up, then you have many other Asian countries growing. Even India began to grow after its uh, reforms in 1990s. And so growth and prosperity have spread from East Asia to Southeast Asia and now to South Asia and even all the way to Africa. So when we consider that the two oceans are linked, all the threats and potential opportunities are linked, the energy slocks are linked, even uh, threats such as terrorism uh, are linked. Uh, the only way to give full uh, sort of uh, expression to uh, the reality of today is to have a more broad-based concept, and that is the concept called the Indo-Pacific. This is the general idea of the Indo-Pacific, which includes the uh, North Pacific Ocean, the South Pacific Ocean, the South China Sea. Uh, typically, the East China Sea would also come into that large uh, construct. Uh, and you have the both the eastern and western flanks of the Indian Ocean all the way to Africa. Defining the Indo-Pacific has taken some time because different people have referred to it in a different way. 
Prime Minister Abe has spoken about it in 2007. Um, uh, in 2017, President Trump spoke about his, you know, free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Um, and India has also given its uh, uh, vision. Ours is a very inclusive and expansive definition. Uh, and it's based on our historical experience of broad trade and cultural and civilizational connectivity to the broadest possible theater uh, around us. And uh, Prime Minister Modi had expressed these views in the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore uh, in 2018, um, 2019, sorry, 18, 18, I beg your pardon. I can't see it here because part of my slide is blocked. Um, broadly, it um, encompasses the Indian and Pacific Ocean maritime spaces. Uh, and um, our vision, which is more broad-based and inclusive, has been reassuring, in my view, for Russian and Chinese scholars as well. Importance of the cannot be overstated. Again, uh, some of the world's most populous uh, states are here. Um, uh, the, some of the biggest democracies are around. Some of the largest Muslim states are here. Um, uh, of the 10 largest uh, standing armies in the world, seven are in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it's also home to some of the busiest seaports and uh, merchant uh, shipping in the world. Um, defense and security relations in the Indo-Pacific, again, are an important adjunct of this concept. Uh, my proposition is that security is indivisible. And therefore, what happens in one part of uh, this theater uh, impacts on the other part as well. What happens in the Indian Ocean is bound to have an impact on uh, the Pacific Ocean or the South China Sea and vice versa. Um, and uh, uh, there is existing linkage all along uh, a thread that runs through on account of terrorism, radical ideologies, proliferation, opportunities, challenges, threats, they're all interlinked. And I particularly spoke of the thread that runs through all the way from our part of the world to the Pacific. That includes terrorism. You can see the linkages between the terror groups in the AFPAC area and the terror groups that offer, operate in the Philippines also. You can see how proliferation runs all the way from the Western Indian Ocean. And you can see that uh, uh, radical ideologies have also spread from this part of the world connecting all the way to Southeast Asia and the Pacific. So we need to keep all this in mind. Uh, now, the, the key point I also made was about India's vision being more open and inclusive. What India has spoken about is an open and inclusive architecture with ASEAN centrality, equal access to the great commons, freedom of navigation, overflight and unimpeded commerce, importance of connectivity, a rules-based order and dialogue as a means to resolve disputes. There is a, a convergence now that is emerging between a few countries in the Indo-Pacific. As you can see that uh, now the United States, Japan, Australia and India are all speaking of an open and inclusive architecture. All are speaking of a free, open and transparent rules-based order. All of these four countries are speaking of what you call uh, a, 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 a system in which ASEAN is central. Uh, and this, therefore, gives a certain reassurance even to countries in Southeast Asia who earlier we were being told that they will be left out of this concept of the Indo-Pacific. Australia recently has strengthened its bilateral ties with India. Uh, just recently, we had a virtual summit between India and uh, Australia at the level of the two prime ministers. And um, we have what is now called upgraded our partnership to a comprehensive strategic partnership. We have growing, uh, you know, uh, trade and uh, military links between the two countries. We have a larger number of joint exercises. such as the Navy, Takadu, which is uh, again uh, a naval exercise, uh, an air force exercise called Pitch Black. Uh, there is a new mutual logistic support agreement that we have concluded between India and Australia. There is a shared vision.
for maritime cooperation in the Indo Pacific. And we have a 2 plus 2 dialogue that has been upgraded to the ministerial level. With Japan, India has what we call a special strategic and global partnership. There is a personal relationship between Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Abe. Beyond that, Japan is present in virtually every infrastructure project in India. Japan is India's largest, one of our largest investors, cumulative investment being more than $30 billion. We are also enhancing our naval and military cooperation with Japan. We have signed a number of agreements and more recently we have included Japan as a regular participant in Malabar exercises. And in the Malabar exercise, uh, more sophisticated platforms are being brought, uh, such as uh, P-8 aircraft, submarines, etc. And uh, there is growing cooperation on anti-submarine warfare uh, uh, sector between India and Japan as well. With the United States, India has uh, uh, an indispensable partnership in every sector uh, of India's transformation and, and progress. Uh, we have a 2 plus 2 dialogue at the ministerial level. Uh, India is a major non-NATO ally of the United States. It's not got an alliance partnership, mind you, please don't misunderstand. We are a major defense partner and we have signed a number of agreements such as uh, LEMOA, uh, that's a logistics agreement, uh, COMCASA, that's a communications agreement, GSOMIA, which is uh, a security of uh, classified information agreement. And more recently, we have signed what is called the industrial security uh, industrial security uh, agreement, in the industrial security agreement. Yes. And uh, the largest number of defense exercises that we do with any country today is with the United States. So defense imports from the United States has now to $19 between 2014 and 2019. Now, having said this, let's also say that things are trying to test it and strong additional production. So, it speaks volumes for India's ability to have been able to balance ties between its traditional friends and its growing partnership with countries like the United States of America. Russia still remains one of the big providers of defense equipment uh, to the Indian Armed Forces. And we greatly value that. Um, now, I that the extra-regional powers in the Indo-Pacific uh, is a term which is used often by those that don't want the United States or France or Britain in this space. But the fact of the matter is that none of these, USA, France, Australia, UK, none of them are external they all have, some of them have territories, some of them trade and economic all go back a very long time. The point I'm making is that the so-called extra regional powers are actually resident powers and regional powers. And we have to keep that in mind. Now, all the P5 countries are present in the Indo-Pacific. Frankly, even Russia is present in the Indo-Pacific because Russia is a Pacific power. As much as any other country, Russia is a Pacific power. I want to therefore uh, say that uh, there is um, a propaganda against the Indo-Pacific, uh, which uh, makes it out to be some kind of uh, uh, a very big uh, uh, diabolical plan, uh, which is uh, being made for containment of China. Uh, I cannot agree with that because India has said this time and again that it is for what we call an open and inclusive architecture. We also believe that even Russia will have a role to play in this because Russia is, as I said, a Pacific power. Russia is also a Eurasian power. And Eurasia overlooks both the Indian ports. It is very important for countries like Russia not to misunderstand that uh, there is scope for all of us to work together in bringing uh, greater clarity to the concept of the Indo-Pacific. Um, in uh, the case of uh, regional perceptions now, we find that there is growing con congruence in the Quad, the so-called quadrilateral security dialogue. But remember that the quadrilateral 
grouping is just only one of many, many uh, groupings that operate at a bilateral, trilateral, and plurilateral levels. The quadrilateral group is not a military alliance. It is not a naval alliance. It is not some kind of a treaty uh, partnership. It is simply a group that is discussing uh, shared interests, more particularly with regard to uh, things like uh, freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight, capacity building, uh, also humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and uh, uh, things like counterterrorism. Uh, so we have to keep in mind this thing. Now, a, a couple of interesting points here. You see, Japan had started off with what they call a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. But because of their improving relations with China, after an interregnum of more than five years, uh, they had difficult ties uh, 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 between 2012 and 2017. Uh, ties had uh, tailspinned uh, out of control. And uh, both Japan and China were trying to improve their bilateral relations. In that context, uh, the Japanese and the Chinese have jointly celebrated their 40th anniversary uh, and 45th anniversary, respectively, uh, of uh, their bilateral agreements of the 1970s, you know, uh, of 1973 and 1977, respectively. And uh, Pre President Xi Jinping was expected to visit Japan this year. So keeping the ameliorating ties in mind between Japan and China, Japan had quietly dropped the word strategy from its uh, use of that term, free and open. So now they don't talk about free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. They simply say free and open Indo-Pacific. Also have a growing consensus uh, between themselves. Uh, they as a group also favored ASEAN centrality. Uh, they don't want to take sides between China and the United States. Uh, it's not just that Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar don't want to take sides. Even Vietnam uh, often says it doesn't want to take sides. Vietnam has what is called the four no's policy. No to military bases, no to military alliances and things of the sort. So in other words, uh, there is a growing level of discomfort, of course, between uh, in many countries, uh, uh, between this having to choose between China and the United States of America. Uh, in the Pacific, there is a new contestation which is taking place, U.S. versus China in the small island countries. And the U.S. has come back with uh, what they call the uh, Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, uh, the BUILD Act. There is some, something else called Asia Edge. Uh, and there is a new commitment uh, through the Blue Dot Network and the Asia Pacific uh, you know, Business Forum, uh, where uh, America and its uh, like-minded partners are trying to create a new narrative for uh, connectivity and infrastructure and developmental finance in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, Russia and China I should say China and Russia have expressed misgivings about the Indo-Pacific. ASEAN and China have yet to reach a consensus <coughs> on the, excuse me, on the code of conduct in the South China Sea. China's suspicions are about US strategy to contain its rise, oppose Belt and Road uh, Initiative, question developmental finance and connectivity. China is worried that uh, the Quad may become an Asian NATO uh, and China is also concerned that the use of the term Indo-Pacific lowers its own importance. It would much rather prefer the term Asia-Pacific in which China is the central figure. When you say Indo-Pacific, China is not the central figure. There are other countries also like India, which have been given a certain amount of importance. So to that extent, the Chinese are extremely, extremely uh, sort of... Uh, uh, very suspicious of this term called Indo-Pacific. Recently, however, I have reason to believe that the Chinese are quite open to the idea of discussing the Indo-Pacific, at least internally, uh, more readily than in the past. This is because even the other countries like the United States, Japan, Australia, and India have spoken about ASEAN centrality. And ASEAN centrality is now seen by China as an opportunity to promote its own interests and to control the outcome of the discourse because China has close relations with ASEAN. China has a growing uh, influence over the ASEAN. 
whether economic or strategic. So this is helping uh, the uh, Chinese to be a little more open-minded uh, in terms of the future shape of the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, all countries today are facing this pressure, uh, whether to go with the United States uh, Millennium Corporation initiative or whether to go with the Belt and Road initiative. Uh, in fact, there is a either with us or against us kind of atmosphere today. And this is where diplomacy comes in. Uh, this is where countries have to tread carefully without, um, you know, sort of alienating any. Um, but I think uh, we will have to continue to work together on this. Uh, I should stop here because uh, I should allow us uh, time to perhaps uh, interact maybe through a Q&A. Um, I would have uh, preferred to show you some more slides, but unfortunately, uh, it is not working out. Before I stop, let me also say that uh, the Quad itself is uh, now expanding to include, as part of its inclusive approach, other dialogue partners. Recently, for instance, especially after COVID-19 pandemic broke out, a Quad Plus structure has been created. In the Quad Plus structure, which is more inclusive and more acceptable, we have actually had discussions with many other countries. Uh, uh, we have had discussions including countries like South Korea and um, uh, even um, uh, New Zealand. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, countries like uh, uh, Israel and Brazil um, have also figured. Vietnam has figured in some of these talks. So the Quad Plus is something that is likely to grow and expand in the years to come. And that will make it more inclusive. I also want to say that in terms of maritime exercises also, uh, certain exercises have taken place in the South China Sea. Of course, Russia and China have also carried out exercises in the South China Sea. The uh, Americans, Australians, uh, Vietnam and Japan have carried out a maritime exercise. And India, America, uh, uh, Japan and the Philippines have carried out a joint maritime exercise. So when we speak of the Quad, it is not necessary to always relate it to the Malabar construct. That is to say, maritime exercises be taking place, say, between Japan, India, and uh, the United States of America may get expanded to include Australia in the near future. But that is not the only quad. As I mentioned, there are other quads in which Vietnam and the Philippines have also figured, even in terms of maritime exercises. And at a broader dialogue level, the Quad Plus is providing an opportunity for affected countries within the quad to dialogue with others like Brazil, Israel, South Korea, uh, Vietnam, etc. So I think it's a work in progress. There is scope to uh, therefore involve others in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, I think it's not necessary to suspect it of motives which are uh, actually speculative. Um, as far as the UNCLOS is concerned in the Indo-Pacific, you see, this is supposed to be the bedrock of international law that will guide uh, issues uh, concerning uh, law of the sea. But here we have seen that while UNCLOS seeks to ensure peaceful, cooperative, legally defined use of the seas and oceans for the individual and common benefit of mankind, uh, it has certain definitions. Territorial sea is 12 miles. The contiguous sea is another uh, 12 miles. And then the uh, exclusive economic zone is 200 miles. There is therefore the question of jurisdiction. There is the question of continental uh, shelf rights. Uh, and many countries are expanding their uh, petitions before UNCLOS, uh, giving additional data uh, to expand their continental shelf rights and uh, the uh, exclusive economic zone. Then there is the question of innocent passage freedom of navigation, resolution of disputes, and reference to uh, what you call uh, uh, arbitral uh, you know, tribunals, etc. We saw that there was a reference made by the Philippines uh, for arbitration 
uh, in the case of its own dispute with China, where China has occupied the Mischief Reef, the Fiery Cross Reef, and the Scarborough Shoal, uh, which is all within uh, Philippines uh, exclusive economic zone. And uh, these are territories over which Philippines has uh, a, a claim. And when China has occupied these territories, uh, you are aware that the Philippines went to uh, arbitration and the permanent court of arbitration gave a decision a few years ago in favor of the Philippines. And this was totally rejected by China and China said no. Now the fact of the matter is that China has signed the UNCLOS but not ratified it. And uh, the United States has not neither signed nor ratified UNCLOS. In reality, the tenets of UNCLOS are being followed in my view more by the Americans less by the Chinese. I'm not saying this in order to uh, condone the American uh, action uh, of unilateralism that it is also capable of because as you are aware, Professor, as much as I am, that the Americans also conduct unilateral FONOPS, freedom of navigation operations in uh, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, they conduct FONOPS even against what, we, what they call friendly countries. In 2017, they conducted FONOPS against 17 or 20 countries. And uh, guess which countries were part of that list? India was part of that list. Indonesia was part of that list. Uh, Vietnam and the Philippines were also part of that list. So the point I'm broadly making is that UNCLOS is supposed to guide everyone's work, but it has not really worked very well. Uh, it has not worked well in terms of arbitration mechanisms. It has not worked well in terms of you know, uh, fulsome uh, subscription because some of the major contestants are not uh, really following or ratifying it like the United States and China. Uh, and um, this has actually created uh, uh, a, a bigger problem for uh, many others. Um, I feel that uh, the UNCLOS also has other challenges uh, because uh, there are non-traditional threats also that it has to deal with like uh, unregulated, um, uh, you know, uh, an illegal fishing, uh, uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking, climate change, piracy, environmental degradation, terrorism. All these are issues that they have to deal with. In the South China Sea, there is a new issue. The Chinese are now using excessive straight baselines in order to stake out claims over uh, the uh, whole of the South China Sea. That's also creating competing and overlapping claims. Uh, I was talking about uh, the landmark ruling on the South China Sea dispute in 2016, which China refused to accept. But um, there was a similar dispute between India and Bangladesh a few years ago. And a similar reference was made for arbitration. And in this case, the arbitral award went in favor of Bangladesh. And India accepted the award and gave up the territory and its rights and claims over to Bangladesh. So the point is, UNCLOS can only succeed if countries are willing to support that rules-based order. If that is not supported, then obviously UNCLOS cannot do much. Thank you. Uh, thank Shall you very ready? much. Uh, Ambassador Chinmay, uh, we have quite a few questions here. And sure. Let me begin with my own question. I'll misuse my position. Please. <laughs> right. Um, well, the question is about the concept of the Indo-Pacific. Yes. Uh, you probably know, uh, Ru officially Russia is against it. And the reason is that it, well, we are kind of independent scholars here, so we don't have necessarily to subscribe to the official position, but the official position has its logic because it says that in the Pacific concept is actually a kind of cover for the quad dialogue. And you explained that uh, the quad dialogue is not uh, kind of against and direct, is not directed against anybody, but uh, as Russia sees it, there are four countries there and at least three of them, I'm not talking about India now, but the other three are very much uh, kind of uh, anti-Chinese anti at the moment. Or, or they are, I would say, 
Oh. Yeah. If we ask for a connection, please uh, allow us to come in. We are trying to re-establish the main connection. I'm sure. talking to you from a mobile phone right now. Yes. Yes. So um, I'm saying this in this uh, quad dialogue um, of format. Uh, most countries, especially the uh, I'm not talking about India, but the other three, they are kind of uh, apprehensive about China. And uh, in Russia and also in China, the officials see that it's kind of a, uh, a scheme of uh, uh, a, a scheme of excluding Russia and China from the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and because of it, uh, Russia and China are against the concept. Uh, uh, so the question is, uh, what can be done uh, to include Russia and China in the format of the Indo-Pacific? Now, Professor, your point is that out of the four countries, three of them have bad relations with China, that they are anti-China. Frankly, today we are in an age where no country can say that they will have bad relations permanently with one or the other. Let's face it, Japan, as I explained to you, is trying its best right now to have good relations with China. They even dropped the term strategy from their free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. They jointly celebrated the anniversaries in 2017 and 2018, the anniversaries of the establishment of diplomatic relations and also resumption of ties, etc. They were looking forward to this visit. So the Japanese are very cautious people, as you know. Uh, and uh, to make a blanket statement that three out of the four are anti-China doesn't work because you look at Australia's own dependence on China. Uh, it has a very large part of its exports. I think 30% of its exports go to China. Prosperity in Australia is entirely dependent on whether they can sell something to Australia to China or not. And the US-China relationship also is huge. Decoupling for the United States on the economic front is not going to be easy. And I therefore do not believe that uh, the Indo-Pacific is uh, you know, some kind of uh, uh, an anti-China gang. I can't say that. Yes, I can say that it is a group of like-minded countries and there are certain shared interests and values. And one of those values is openness and transparency. Mind you, if you study the statements that came out of United States, Japan, and Australia a couple of years ago, they used to talk about one of the values being democracy. Democratic was the word being used. In the last one year, they have quietly dropped the word democracy. Why have they dropped it? Because there has been a realization that the definition of democracy is different from one country to the other. And there are countries like Vietnam and others which do not necessarily follow the same kind of democracy that the West is following. So like Japan dropped the word strategy, even USA, Australia and Japan have dropped the word democracy. Because Let's say you want to work with Vietnam tomorrow in this group. Vietnam is not a democracy. It's got a socialist uh, kind of different system. Uh, in their own view, they may be enjoying certain democratic rights and all that. That's fair. It's an interpretation that they have of their own uh, you know, political system which they value. So I, I don't think one should look at the Indo-Pacific in such a narrow, confined uh, way, that it's an anti-China group. That's what the Chinese tell people. Because I told you that uh, China would much rather have the Asia Pacific as a concept, even as a strategic concept. Asia Pacific equals to Chinese centrality. And Indo-Pacific equals to China sharing that space with others, which is more democratic. Obviously, the broader definition, the more inclusive definition, that is the Indo-Pacific, which is not restrictive, is more open and inclusive. Well, thank you very much. We have a question from Sergey Trush. Could we switch, turn on his microphone? Are you here? 
He's an expert on uh, Sino-US relations. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Chinoy, for a very extensive historically and uh, theoretically uh, perspective on the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Um, let me ask you, what is your reading on the internal political situation inside China? China is uh, facing many challenges, uh, the relations with, with the states, they have internal challenges of, of uh, political evolution and economic strategy. To what extent do you think uh, that uh, um, China under Xi Jinping is being uh, quite effectively controlled from the center? And what is your uh, understanding of this situation? Thank you. Well, uh, since uh, you study uh, Chinese politics, uh, you know very much uh, the fact that uh, uh, currently President Xi Jinping has assumed uh, uh, what can be described as total power in China. Uh, president Xi Jinping is uh, not just the president, but he's also chairman of the Central Military Commission. He's also Secretary General uh, of the, uh, you know, General Secretary of the uh, Communist Party of uh, China. M moreover, he's also uh, chairman of all the leading groups today that discuss anything to do with security, internal security, external relations, national security, military affairs. And so power today is concentrated in the hands of one single leader. Now, uh, in the past also, China has had very, very strong central leaders. Uh, Mao Zedong himself was a very strong leader. Uh, and then you had Tang Xiaoping, who was also a very strong leader. But regardless of their style of centralized decision making, both of them uh, were relatively uh, more in the old style of uh, more broad-based, collegial, consensus-driven uh, decision-making uh, style. More so in the case of Tang Xiaoping, where he always uh, used to consult the party elders, the eight elders, as they were called. After the end of the Cultural Revolution, uh, Tang's style was more consultative. Uh, as you are aware, Tang gave up most of his uh, key posts uh, after handing over to Chiang Zemin in 1989. The last of his key central posts he gave up, uh, you know, in uh, 1990. I think it was the chairmanship of the Central Military Commission. And he died six years later in 1996. Uh, yet in those six years, he remained the supreme leader. He was clearly the senior most leader. And his only official title was. Uh, honorary, uh, you know, uh, chairperson of the China Bridge Association or some such thing. So the point I'm making is that today you have a China in which there is unprecedented centralization. There is uh, much more control. Um, there is use of the internet and artificial intelligence uh, internally also to govern and to uh, scrutinize and control the people. The flow of information is controlled like never before. And uh, it is almost as if uh, China is going into a paranoid stage uh, of its uh, you know, development. Uh, there is also uh, the problem that uh, President Xi Jinping has no anointed successor. In 2018, he pushed through some constitutional reforms, which will ensure that he will not be bound by the limit of two terms. Uh, his uh, second term will end in uh, you know, 2022. And uh, theoretically, in 2023, uh, at the NPC, you would have seen a new leader. But the sixth generation leadership, which is to follow, has completely, completely uh, been wiped out. So there is a lot of resentment, I am uh, given to understand, in China. Uh, not that they can do much about it. Uh, there may be constraints. But it is not as if everything is, uh, uh, you know, nice and bubbly like champagne and, you know, uh, all, all uh, hunky dory. There are internal uh, rumblings of dissent, and in the first 15 days of the pandemic, for some strange reason, the control mechanism of the party on information flows was not in evidence. And a great deal of that internal rumbling could be seen on Chinese social media 
and portals as well as to the kind of uh, resentment that there was against the style of functioning. After 15 days, after the pandemic, suddenly the party control system kicked in and became very efficient. Thereafter, of course, go back to business as usual, which is that you will never know the real truth because it's all hidden, swept under the carpet or, you know, depends on what the party thinks it would like to reveal. So there is a problem and there are uh, economic difficulties that China is also bound to face. There is rising unemployment there. And after all, everything revolves around one man. So, uh, you know, we wish him good health. We wish him everything. But the point is, uh, what is the plan of action for the future? Uh, if for some reason, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping is not available, who comes to power? Who takes over? Uh, will everybody else who follows him blindly agree to the Belt and Road Initiative and all the vast amounts of money that have to be spent? Will some of them consider the Belt and Road Initiative to, initiative to be a potential waterloo for uh, the Chinese or the as, the Afgan, as Afghanistan was for the Soviet Union? Uh, who knows? It's a question of overstretching. Uh, and not every leader may look at it the same way. So I think that China's uh, uh, future is predicated on these uh, uncertainties as well. It is not a given that uh, uh, the future is now there for China to, to simply grab and uh, uh, it's, it's a, a foregone conclusion. Much will depend on the resilience of the Communist Party of China. Its ability to adapt itself to the uh, new levels of uh, very, very high levels of economic uh, power, military uh, capability and influence that it has acquired uh, to be able to adapt itself. Uh, in a in a very uh, sort of uh, acceptable manner uh, without inviting a pushback both internally and externally right now i think there is a fair bit of a pushback externally and there are indications that uh, the internal situation is not without a pushback so where does that leave you in the future you know with uncertainty written all over the people's republic of china so I, i'm not too sure whether uh, I mean, no communist parties, uh, professor, have lasted, uh, you know, as long as the uh, Chinese party is, 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 has been around now. And so it's a matter of time, you know, unless you adapt, political change will come to China, whether they like it or not. And mind you, in the earlier days, the CCP was a little more flexible uh, in terms of uh, hide your capacities, bide your time, that famous dictum of uh, Tang Xiaoping, they took it fairly seriously. It was in keeping with Chinese culture, not to show off, not to openly take up, uh, you know, uh, sort of conflict situations with others and to try and, uh, you know, in a wise manner, bide your time and get to your destination. That's the kind of policy that was being followed until recently, but no longer. Now China is on a rampage. You know, it's, it's my way or the highway. And uh, nobody is going to accept it. In fact, there will be a lot of pushback against it. It's a matter of time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Of course, unlike President Trump, we, are not, we don't have to discuss China all the time. So, uh, <laughs> and there's a question from one of our students about India. Well, he, he, he wanted to ask, uh, well, that some academics and scholars now see India as, a few, as one of the future world leaders or global leaders. And the question is, is India sees itself as such and is it ready for this role? Look, my own view is that uh, there is no need for India to set any particular goals, except the fundamental goal of developing its economy, bringing more prosperity to its large population, to ensure peace and tranquility on its periphery, and then to contribute to global peace, prosperity, and development. That is the basic goal. So world leader, it's a matter of definition, you know. So uh, Russia is uh, a leader in many ways. America is a leader in many ways. India is a leader in many ways. I mean, India, for 2,000 years, we have given to uh, the world uh, figures like uh, the Buddha, 
uh, more recently we have given a figure like mahatma gandhi we have achieved our own freedom without firing a single shot how many revolutions around the world can you cite professor where large hundreds of millions of people have been freed from the shackles of authoritarian colonial rule without a single shot being fired in that sense mahatma gandhi's fight for the independence of india goes down in the annals of history as an example of the principles that were also propounded by gautam buddha 2500 years ago of peace and non violence you know of introspection of self improvement so if you say that india is a world leader i would say india is proud to have contributed certain values to the global system in the past as well <coughs> and we hope to continue to do that in the future we still abide by those principles if you look at india's uh, pharmaceutical industry today we are one of the biggest players in the world we have provided in the pandemic uh, aid and assistance pharmaceutical assistance to a number of countries sending drugs vital drugs like uh, uh, you know the ones required to fight the pandemic uh, hydro, hydro hydroxychloroquine and, and stuff like that uh, so the point i'm making is yes if you say what can india be for the world i would say readily and i've said this in my writings also that india can be a vishwa vaidya a global doctor to the rest of the world india has already been a global it provider and supporter for the rest of the world uh, through our it experts and through our software it doesn't mean that india is a global leader in everything for that matter no country can be a global leader in in everything and tomorrow's china is also not going to be a global leader in everything so we have to each have our space respect what we are capable of doing and contribute for the common good that's the way i see india's future i don't have any false labels that i want to put on to india that india is going to be a global leader global leader can be respected only if there is democracy in global structures today we have a un security council which is an archaic formation of 1945 it does not represent today's world it includes some potent powers and some spent powers and yet it is there before you it has shown how impotent it was and passive it was during the pandemic it has done nothing it did more in response to the ebola but it has done nothing with regard to the pandemic because it has been brought to a grinding halt because of its own internal dissent and contradictions so does being a permanent member of that security council make anyone a great power power out there no i would say no even the permanent five will have to hang their heads in shame because they can't call themselves great power if they've done nothing for the international community while sitting in that exclusive club what's the point so you can be a global leader no matter where you are you can be a global leader even if you are a small country but you have to have something positive to give to the rest that's the way i would look at it <coughs> well, thank you very much we have a great india scholar expert tatiana shoman here do you want to make some comment or ask a question or whatever tatiana lewalna she is the head of department of indian studies at the institute of oriental studies thank you very much professor lukin Uh, and thank you very much the ambassador uh, for your very interesting very comprehensive and very detailed presentation of the real situation uh, from the medieval time in the in the pacific and uh, i'm very grateful for you for that and after that we uh, uh, you know touched some interesting questions and i think that uh, when we are talking about the in the pacific with these four countries i think that we should remind that now in the system of international relations that is a lot of several uh, groups organization maybe not organization in the full sense of this word uh, which uh, united the very different countries uh very different and sometimes which are located in the very long distance from each others thousands kilometers 
I would like to mention maybe BRICS, where the members of BRICS are the countries which are very different uh, in the position, very different of their economic development, very different in their uh, orientation. And the same we can say about uh, the, in the Pacific, which we are talking about the India, Japan, Australia, United States. It is really very different countries and with some specific relationship between, between each other, you know, but we discussing that. But in this uh, context, I would like again to uh, maybe to ask the question about the real future of China in this region. What do you think? What kind of development? We were talking about that, and you were talking about that a, lo a, lo a lot. But what is your uh, position? What do you think about that? We, uh, we know, we see that the relationship with China of these four countries are specific. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very interesting question, Professor, that you've asked. You. And you have uh, almost tempted fate by asking me a question on China, which is my favorite subject. So <laughs> you are the one who will have to shoulder the blame if I start talking too much you know, on China. But uh, let me put it this way, that uh, future of China, you see, in order to understand the future of China, we must see China's past as well. Now, China is an ancient civilization, which uh, was transformed completely with a communist ideology when the People's Republic of China was formed in 1949. In many ways, I feel it lost something of the original China at that point. It lost something of the culture. It lost something of its history. It lost something of its mindset and values as well, as it adopted a new ideology, a new religion called communism and began to work on the basis of its own unique Chinese conditions, as in socialism with Chinese characteristics, which of course is something that came later. But China was struggling with that in the 50s also to devise its own kind of communism, which made it, uh, how shall I say, uh, uh, in, in, in some kind of a conflicting position with the then USSR as well. Uh, now, between 1949 and 1979, I term this the first phase of China's development, as we know it today. These 30 years, there was a great deal of consolidation of territory. And you can say it's that phase in which China stood up, as Mao Zedong would have said, you know, that the Chinese people have, they have all stood up. And they are a proud nation. They have acquired their territory, defined borders by moving into Xinjiang in 1949, into Tibet, sending the PLA in 1950, having a border war with India in 1962, trying to uh, you know, dominate Vietnam in 1979, and so on and so forth, of course. So the point I'm making is first 30 years is political consolidation, but a lot of chaos. While there was territorial consolidation, there was a lot of chaos in China. There was the anti-rightist uh, campaign. There was the great leap forward of the 1950s. There was the famine of the early 60s. There was the great proletariat cultural revolution, which lasted 10 years and wreaked havoc uh, for an entire generation. Uh, and China emerged from this in shambles, absolute shambles. There was a virtual civil war there between the Red Guard factions shooting at each other. You had the gang of four that usurped power uh, towards the end of the Cultural Revolution. And when Mao wanted a successor, he appointed Wa Kuofeng, who was also uh, a transitory figure, stayed around only for a very short while and was gone because Tang Xiaoping came to power. So this is the first phase. In the second phase, you have 30 years of economic reforms and growth from 1979 roughly to 2009. In this period, China completely transforms itself. It has the four modernizations. It has this policy of opening up, open door policy. 
It has the policy of uh, having uh, what you call uh, special economic zones and cities. And FDI is flooding in, growth is taking place, and it becomes a trade behemoth in the international arena, the world's largest uh, you know, trading nation. And it is also an, a, a period in which the Chinese have some monumental achievements in their view. They see the end of the Soviet Union. They are determined that they will not make the same mistakes. They also see some advantage that unlike the Soviet Union, they began with the countryside, began with agriculture, because that's where all revolutions in China came from, historically speaking. And they were careful with that. They were careful with the fact that they were able to pass through the Asian economic crisis in the 1990s, in 1999, without being affected as much. In fact, they used that opportunity to build even more stronger links and currency swap agreements, etc., with countries uh, in Southeast Asia under the, you know, uh, the, what the Chiang Mai initiative, as you are aware of it. And also, they go through the global economic and financial crisis relatively better. And what is more, like icing on the cake, in 2001, they enter the WTO. It is also a period in which they start seeing the United States is uh, taking it, its eyes off the ball in the uh, Asia Pacific theater because the United States after 2001 was looking to the international war on terror. So this is what I call the golden period, a golden 30 year period that follows. It's a period of Midas touch. Nothing can go wrong for China. Everything is successful. You know? And it is a period which contrasts with the first 30 years of chaos, first 30 years of political turmoil and suffering. Then begins the third 30 year period. 2009 onwards and beginning 2009 you can see the Chinese economy is slowing down growth rates are falling you have Xi Jinping come to power contradictions are rising with neighboring countries contradictions are rising with the United States of America and there is no guarantee how this 30 year period will pan out the first 10 years of this third 30 year period to me have shown a lot of cracks in China's rise. It's like a huge rocket waiting on the launching pad to take off for Mars. But it's also a rocket with potential leaks. Gases are leaking out while the rocket is on the launch pad. There are hissing sounds. There is a little flame that you can see here and there. You don't know what's going to happen to all that fuel in the rocket and the booster rockets that are strapped onto the rocket. And there is only one pilot in that uh, nose cone of the rocket, and that's Xi Jinping. Now, take a guess. I am finding it very difficult to look very far ahead. The best I can see is a few years ahead. But I find that there will be stress points. 2021, you have the 100th anniversary of the uh, establishment of the Communist Party of China. And there are great expectations in China. Of course, it's very public knowledge now that they wanted to double their GDP of 2010 by 2020. And that has not happened. It has not happened. In 2027, the PLA will celebrate its 100th anniversary. In 2035, they want to reach what you call a moderate uh, level of uh, uh, scientific and uh, uh, you know, modernization for the PLA, etc. And by 2049, they want to realize the China dream. How will you realize the China dream without incorporating Taiwan back into the territory of China? And today, it is anyone's guess if the PLA tries to make a move on Taiwan by 2027, before its own 100th anniversary, or before 2049, which is to realize the China dream, you are quite certain to get involvement of the United States of America and perhaps other alliance partners also in that kind of a whirlpool. Will that be good for China? Are you sure China will be able to come out of it without any impact on itself? What will happen? So there are so many questions. More than that, as I told you, succession and economic uh, difficulties in the future. Because China has the world's largest debt. 270% of its GDP. It has a large number of zombie companies. 
in the in the uh, you know what you call the state owned enterprises zombie companies that can survive only if they have more debt and they need more debt to even pay off their debts so 10% of chinese state owned enterprises are zombie companies and there is no real information coming out of uh, uh, you know there's no professional information either in the economic space or uh, in the in the uh, social space so for me it's a very big question mark on the future china as a civilization will continue for thousands of years but if you say china as a country led by one party will that continue for thousands of years will it continue for 50 years i have my big big doubts on that big doubts well thank you very much uh, actually we have a strange situation that our india experts ask questions about china and china specialists ask, <laughs> ask questions about india so my last question is about both uh, as an expert on uh, territorial dispute could you see any prospects for solving a territorial dispute the territorial dispute with china because we in russia managed to do it we like made compromises divided the disputed territory approximately 50 50 but is something like this possible in india look let's start with the historical proposition in the chinese view it was uh, a czarist russia that had occupied in their view that had occupied large tracts of chinese territory so in other words when you speak about a 50 50 resolution the chinese were going to get something which historically had been lost to a neighbor russia being a mature power was willing to go halfway and compromise and part with certain territory in order to have peace security and friendship across across its borders now take the question of india china relations in our case it is exactly the opposite it is china that has unilaterally gobbled up large parts of territory as the communists moved into tibet for the first time they started moving on to the borders borders on which they had not been for centuries and there were these fantastic claims and nibbling and salami slice movement in the western sector in ladakh in aksai chin elsewhere also in the middle sector the eastern sector everywhere there was a uniform attempt to extend its boundaries what they pitched by way of boundaries was not where they were they went up to those lines as a result of gradual incremental salami slicing and then through active aggression now we have a situation where both sides have a large number of agreements institutionalized mechanism for dialogue and by and large we have maintained peace and tranquility for a long time except that it is sad to hear that in an incident yesterday there has been some loss of life in the current standoff in the western sector but broadly speaking with such a large number of differences over the boundary question and the line of actual control even in definitional terms even in terms of where it lies on the ground our commitment broadly speaking to peace and tranquility has been fairly good the record is good barring this exception where the chinese have engaged in some unilateralism and aggression yesterday the other point is that the two sides in order to resolve this question must have what you call a sincere dialogue in terms of exchanging maps i am sure the russians know this better when they settled their boundary with china they would have had to sit with each other and show each other their boundary lines as you perceive it and the chinese would have to show their boundary line as they perceive it on large scale maps now china has refused to undertake this exercise for reasons best known to itself we have been ready we made an effort 20 years ago when i was the head of the expert group of diplomatic and military officials we worked very hard to create maps large scale maps of the middle sector where there is relatively a smaller problem and to 
build trust and confidence in order to gain some experience we started with that we exchange maps of each other's line but thereafter we have to do some joint delineation on a single map we have to thereafter do some ground surveys and the chinese refused to do all of that till today the chinese have not agreed to even exchange maps of the line of actual control as it exists in their mind the imagined one the line that they keep talking about when no one quite knows where that line is it's an arbitrary line it's a line where they were never present for centuries where they aspire to move up through military aggression well that line must still be known to us that line they have never expressed that on a large scale map the reason why they don't express this line on a map i can only deduce as a former practitioner that it is because they would much rather follow the type of policy they follow in the south china sea and elsewhere which is gradually nibbling away of territory and then presenting the other side with a fait accompli so if they give a line now it can be very clearly ascertained that they are not there it's a fictitious line but if they don't give the line now and gradually try to creep up to that so called claim line over the next few years and then create a new fact on the ground it works to their advantage so one of the reasons i feel they don't want to exchange maps for which india was always ready and willing is they don't want to be committed to any line at all it's a question of gradually expanding so where do we go from here i think the way forward is to have a dialogue the way forward is to implement all the agreements that we have signed so far all of which speak of peace and tranquility all of which speak of a mutually acceptable resolution to the boundary question all of them speak of having more confidence building measures border personnel meetings we should have uh, exchanges between the two militaries more than uh, what is currently uh, possible and wherever the border protocols are not working very well there is scope to improve upon those drills when troops run into each other in the border areas what should they do there are drills for this there are standard operating procedures and as i said before by and large these have worked well i have been part of making those drills in the past and i can assure you that uh, today if they are not working then it shows to me that there is scope to do more to improve upon them so this is where we should be heading uh, it is it is uh, not my case that uh, uh, you know uh, matters uh, like this dispute should should actually be you know two sides should resort to military means to resolve such disputes no it will set both countries back by decades it's not just india that will be affected china's reputation and soft power is already in tatters right now its uh, military power and and relative economic recovery after the pandemic may be uh, more stable and better in terms of the optics but its soft power its reputation is already in tatters it is a much 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 uh, maligned country already its reputation will go further down if it resorts to unilateralism and to the use of force to arbitrariness in terms of dealing with you know all its neighbors it's dealing in a, with great arbitrariness with the southeast asian countries you can see it there with vietnam as well with malaysia it is uh, uh, sending its uh, you know survey vessels arbitrarily to browbeat uh, first the vietnamese and then the malaysians it is doing illegal fishing of the natuna islands in indonesian waters even when there is no dispute over that indonesian territory it has got uh, issues with japan uh, so uh, let's face it you know this is uh, this kind of behavior is uh, uh, coming out of a country uh, it seems to me that uh, there is a lot of nationalism and hubris in china uh, they look down on uh, many countries i don't want to name all of them um, you may not like it if i name all those countries that they look down upon uh, some of whom have actually taught china all that they know from ballroom dancing to their uh, you know scientific programs there are countries that have historically contributed uh, and taught the chinese the a b c d of these things you know and uh, yet today they look down on many of these important neighbors that they have they think that they have arrived you know and that they uh, the whole world owes it to them that they sit at the head table uh, 
uh, that their place in the sun is some kind of historical uh, you know uh, sort of entitlement because of a century of humiliation uh, but they should also remember that they cannot engage in another century of humiliating others simply because they were humiliated in the past well there were many others who were humiliated today we have uh, good relations with uh, great britain that was a, a colonizing power we parted amicably at, as friends in 1947 we've always had good, decent relations we india is not talking of three centuries of two and a half centuries of humiliation and therefore india should be entitled to humiliate everybody else no that's not the way to go forward so china's future if china wants to assure it for its people and china has wise people chinese civilization is rich and full of that wisdom but it will have to work carefully and to reduce some of these rough edges that it has developed uh, and not try to emerge as some kind of a new colonial power uh, in a great hurry to displace the united states by the way the united states is not <laughs> the dominant power today on a number of things power is fractured power power is shared there are small states that also exercise power and influence otherwise how will you have the north koreans sitting with the americans at the level of their presidents if power were not fractured power is fractured there is a new asymmetry that is there and asymmetry can be bridged with asymmetrical means new asymmetrical means in the case of north korea you have a few bombs in the basement and a few rockets and you can bridge that asymmetry others are doing it through cyberspace and through trade and through weaponization of other things uh, of of uh, restricting export of rare earths all kinds of asymmetrical gaps can be bridged through asymmetrical means china has to learn to be a responsible member of the international community in that case its future is assured if it is not going to be a responsible member of the international community i can only say that there will be remain a huge question mark on its own future okay thank you very much ambassador you know i 